Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Nimade Beilu, and I am NAMI Delaware's Diversity and Equity Fellow. I'm so excited because each month we do these month mental health conversations, and this month is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, so I thought it was really important to speak with somebody who has some, you know, some traction, some ground within the minority community within Delaware. So I couldn't think of anyone better than Dr. Linda or all right. Uh, she's going to join us and tell us a little bit about herself, and we're going to talk a little bit about mental health. Um, so to start off, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Array. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you, e-meet you, and also when it comes to conversations on, on mental health, those are things that are not only important, but they're things that I'm passionate about. So um, I welcome any opportunity to share with our community. Absolutely. Um, and to start off, can you just tell everybody a little about you? Um, as I mentioned, you you have your hands well within the community. You do a lot, which is wonderful. But um, could you give everybody just like a little synopsis about you? Yes. So I am Dr. Linda Array. And uh, my borrowed name from my husband is Quincy. Don't tell him I said that. Um, but I am the founder of a women's organization called WILD. It's Women in Leadership, Development and Empowerment. And we are a community-based organization for women by women. So we come together to utilize our skill sets and our experiences to really not only improve the, the wellness of women, but also the community. And when I talk about wellness, we fracture wellness based on four pillars and mental wellness, physical wellness, spiritual wellness and financial literacy. Because we believe that as women, we have to be mentally sane. We have to be financially loaded. We have to be spiritually connected and we have to be physically fit. And so what exactly do I mean by these things, you know? We could be so wealthy, but if we're not connected spiritually, emotionally, if we're not physically fit, if we're not mentally sane, none of that money means anything. So whenever I share about our pillars, I always start with mental wellness because that's the most important. But total wellness is really where we want to be. And total wellness involves all these pillars. Because if, if there's any area of this pillars that is broken, then we need to do something about it. So I tell the women of my community, if you were to look at the mirror one day or wake up one day and there's instability in any of these areas, then we need to talk about it because we, we are here to ensure that we are creating communities and homes where we're feeling fulfilled and well in all of these aspects. So that's what WILD is about. We do this through our events. We do a lot of events. It could range from big conferences to small meet and greets to little branches and then our medical missions um, back in underserved communities. And um, I'm also a published author. My book memoirs of a working mother. And it's also about managing expectations of motherhood, channeling love, because after motherhood, there's still a lot of love for us to give and to receive, and also navigating the challenges that come with motherhood. So this book, it's my blueprint and also my tool for working mothers, particularly, but it's really a book that any woman, any person can pick up. I've had some husbands say, I'm a better husband because I read your book. Yeah. So I, I could understand my wife better because I read your book. So while I wrote it with the working mother in mind, it really has a lot of great insight, even for our men and other women that are not mothers. And other than that as well, when I'm not in heels, because I tell people I run my bedroom meetings in six inch heels. I love my heels. But you have cute shoes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So when I'm not in heels, I wear combat boots. So I'm a major in the United States Air Force. I'm a medical service corps officer. And currently I'm assigned to the Defense Health Agency. So I'm the integration officer right now for the Defense Health Agency. So when I'm not in heels, and doing community work and serving and just doing some of the things that I love, 
I wear combat boots and um, serve in that other aspect. And I was sharing, my husband and I, we just recently launched our um, candle and home essentials brand. Candles is something that's so personal to my mental wellness. That's how I release. Mm -hmm. When I come home, clean home, clean kitchen, fresh flowers and candles. That's the full spectrum. So I burn a lot of candles and it was important to me to create a candle brand that is very non-toxic. You know, it's soy based, it's paraben free and very healthy, beautiful fragrances that really just fuels me and my mental wellness. And I said, why don't we share this with the world? So I have this phrase, I say, some people want to buy it, I want to own it. So I said, every time I light a candle, I'm going to be paying myself. So it's a beautiful thing for my family and I to combine our passion for candles, incorporate that into our uh, passion for mental wellness and be able to share that with our, the community, our friends, and just also expanding our network because we get to meet new people every day and share the same passion um, with them. And uh, my most important ministry are my children, my husband, and my home. So as much as um, I'm out there, um, this really is where I serve the most, in my home. So I have two beautiful daughters and um, my, my husband, and a really tight extended family as well of siblings and um, just some friends and, you know, but that is my most important ministry is family. Mm -hmm. so that, that's a little bit about me. I love it. And you, you do so much, um, which, you know, is something that I get plugged with a lot, you know, like, oh my goodness, how do you handle it all? How do you juggle it all? So it's nice listening to somebody who I think has even more on their plate than I do um, and seeing how well you are able to manage all of that. And I think a large part of that has to do with what you started off saying, which is managing those four pillars, you know, your health, your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, and what was the and financial, financial health? health? We can't be saying I'm broke. It doesn't yeah. go like that. It so does not. We have to make sure it's balanced because if you can't pay bills, guess what? You're stressed. You are. You are. And they really oh. do all go together. And I noticed that yeah. when one of mine falls off balance, it quickly pulls the other ones down if I don't try to redirect or fix it. Um, and in the area of mental, you know, we always say mental health is like physical health. Like everybody has it. Sometimes people only think about mental health when they think about mental illness, but yeah. you have mental health regardless. You may have a mental illness, but either way, everyone has mental health. Um, how do you, you talked about it a little bit with your your candles and the flowers, but you know, given that you do so much, how do you stop yourself from overtaxing yourself and from getting a burnout with everything that you do? It's really realizing. So they said there are different stages of burnout that we have to look out for in other people. And it's me realizing that as well. So let's say if somebody, you start noticing certain characteristics at work, it means it's gone too far. If your spouse starts noticing it, then uh, you probably should have done something about it sooner. Not mm -hmm. saying don't communicate, but if they start noticing it without you saying something, you know, so it's me trying to know that it's time for me to do something about it before anybody starts noticing it, even somebody as close as my spouse. Because what I've noticed is, is human nature. We want to wait until we are at that edge. Then we say, let's do something about it. If you're working from a place of burnout already, it's hard to then manage and create that balance in other aspects. And balance is relative because we use this term um, very loosely. And um, because people say there's no balance because you can't really balance everything. There is balance. The question is, what is your definition <laughs> of balance? Mm -hmm. Balance does exist. If you are thinking that balance is just a state of equilibrium and constancy where life is just perfect for the rest of your life, then you're probably understanding it wrong. And you would then say there is no balance. But balance really is our ability to be able to manage the task in our lives, not time. Because I tell people, I said, time is like kinetic energy. We cannot create nor destroy time. So we need to change from the narrative of managing time to managing tasks. 
So how can I effectively manage the task in my life? So you're taking task management and fitting it into your 24 hours. So you ask about, you know, how I practice my own mental wellness so I don't overexert myself. It's really being conscious about how I manage my task. The task could be being mommy, taking care of the kids, being a wife, being a, a corporate entrepreneur, uh, being a service member, whatever those are. In this 24 hours that I have, where is Linda in those 24 hours? And I always make sure in those 24 hours, I have some Linda time. I shared with you about my quiet time. I take those very seriously. And I shared about, I was speaking somewhere and I told the ladies that I, I have two hours of Linda time in 24 hours. And she said, what do you do with two hours of meditation? Plenty. And sometimes it's not enough. It could be in that two hours and it doesn't have to be two consecutive hours, but I need a moment of silence every day to recalibrate my brain. It could be right before bed. It could be in the middle of a day, but I really need my 30 minutes at least of silence. And it could be my drives home. Instead of calling somebody, I've already had a long day, phone calls and meetings. Do I really need to call somebody right now on this drive? How about I play some music? How about I put an inspirational book for my drive? So when I get home, that is my transition between work and home. Yeah. So I'm not coming home and trying to quiet the mess that I left at work or the bees that I left at work. So those two hours of you time, it's not really two hours of you just sitting. And it could be, but it doesn't have to be. But I'm very conscious about how do I manage the task in my day and this little note cards or the notes in my phone really helped me a lot because each day, each day before I go to bed, I look at my calendar for the next day. Mm -hmm. When I wake up, I look at that calendar again and I see, is there anything I need to move? Is there something from yesterday that I didn't do? And just because I didn't do it yesterday, does that mean it's a priority with the things that it's competing with today? And sometimes it's not. I may have to move that thing a couple of days back because it's not a priority. But based on the things that I decide on that day, that is a priority based on what's happening that day, I make sure I specifically say where they go in my 24 hours. And in that, where's Linda? That's my one question when I wake up in the morning and I have to make sure I have my me time. And this is a non-negotiable me time. And it's well communicated in my home. And I also encourage my spouse to do that. Because especially in relationships, when you become a mother, when you become a wife, um, it's so easy to, to, to fall into the routine of everything is about, you know, doing stuff with spouse and kids. Mm -hmm. It's family, family. We need that. It's so important. But we also need different kind of relationships to build and cultivate. I need time with just my girls. I need time with just my husband. I need time as a family. And most importantly, I need Linda time. I need time with me. Yeah. That is the most important commitment. It's with myself. And how would you do that? Maybe some days is meditation, is prayers, because spiritually as well, that's so important to me to have God in my life, in my relationships. So some of this time, it's my time just praise and worship. You know, so I think that the way that I create balance, and as I said, balance doesn't mean my life. I get stressed. There are days that things are chaotic, but I'm very conscious that if things are chaotic at home today, I know that when I'm compromising tomorrow, it's not going to be home. It's going to be the time I work that I would have to compromise because I have to make up for this area that stressed out last week. Yeah. Yes. So I also can have tasks being lacking just because I want to take family vacation or do things. So it's about how do you effectively shift this task that needs to be done and emphasis on need to be done. Cause sometimes you look at your, your schedule and you realize we don't have to worry about this. If I go my entire life and never do this thing on my schedule, nobody's going to die mm. and I will be just fine. So we also have to be very effective about eliminating stuff that doesn't need to be done. So is this thing important? Do, does it have to be done today? Does it have to be done at all? So those are questions that we have to ask ourselves as part of ways to um, free up um, tasks in our schedule. 
Yeah, and I love your the way that you look at it with the creating balances that not just being balances and everything's just you know copacetic and just easy across the board, but sometimes things get hectic and you have to create that balance by then taking away from something else later to pour it back into where you lost it before and to sort of level things back out. Um, I think that's really important. For me it's constant, it it's constant task management. That really is it. Constant task management, making very conscious choices because sometimes we focus on managing this task and then it's weighing in one aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. And another aspect keeps suffering. So we have to do it consciously to make sure that at the end of it all, we are creating some kind of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like you have a really good um, handle on like as far as your mental health and being really self-aware, I think is the first step to sort of figure out what your triggers are, what works for you, what how helps you relax because even as you said your your downtime or your me time isn't all it doesn't always look the same it doesn't always have to be the exact same activity as long as you have that time for yourself um have you always been I guess tapped into mental health is it something that you're aware of or an area that's interesting to you or is that something that you became more comfortable speaking about later so I've always been but not with the same mindset I was that women who believed that balance meant equilibrium and constancy. But what that brought to my life was frustration. Because mm. there's nothing like being a perfectionist and thinking, you know, what well, things should be smooth right now and it's not. So that brings a lot of frustration. So while, while I've always believed in um, prioritizing mental wellness and creating balance in my life, I've not always looked at it the same way. And because I've been there and really suffered that frustration of the way I understood what balance was, it's so important to me to change that narrative when I tell, when I meet people who say there's no balance. Because when you say there's no balance, what comes with that is you're lowering your expectations about having fulfillment in life. Because mm -hmm. when chaos happens, when you're living a chaotic life, you're like, that's just what life is. But now. There is such a thing as really having balance and fulfillment in life. So I also don't like the narrative of there is no balance. There is balance, but it's how we understand and implement it in our lives. That's what we need to look into. And um, in terms of mental wellness, I've always believed in mental wellness. I've always been one of those very outspoken about mental wellness. But some of the ways I have changed that narrative as well in my life is understanding that your mental wellness is your most important priority. Secondly, your mental wellness is your ultimate responsibility. We turn a lot as humans to entrust our happiness, our wellness, how we feel in other people's hands. You know, maybe, maybe mom did this, maybe best friend didn't do this, maybe boyfriend or husband did not do this. In order for all of those people that are important people in our lives to be a part of our mental wellness, we must first take action. We must first say that this is my responsibility. Linda, my mental wellness is my ultimate responsibility. We come from a call, you know, we're talking about, you know, black mental health. We've come a long way. There were days where you are ashamed to say that I have a therapist. People would probably start looking at you differently or say, what's wrong with you? Why are you seeing a therapist? Do you have a man, as you said earlier, do you have uh, some kind of psychotic issue? But why are you going to a therapist? Are you okay? Like, you know, ask those very, they're ignorant questions because people are, they really are very ignorant questions that turn to make people shy more from really sharing um, when they need help. But I'm saying despite, despite, because I've seen people say, well, my community doesn't understand, my family doesn't understand. And I said, despite, it's your ultimate responsibility. If you need to go seek help, go seek help regardless. Even if you have to seek help and don't share with the community that doesn't understand until you can win them over, if that's of enough importance to you, go seek help. Please do not shy away from seeking help because your community will not get it. 
It's your ultimate responsibility. I know it's hard. There is nothing like going through challenges and you don't have a support system. But guess what? They are just a support system. Whose life is it? Yours. Mm -hmm. So regardless, whether you have a supportive community or not, if you feel you need help beyond what you can provide for yourself, go seek help. It's a lot of resources out there. You can pick up a phone and call. You can talk to your provider. Even if they're not a mental health professional, they will direct you. A lot of communities are offering free uh, mental health programs right now. So um, I really urge, no matter the kind of community you're from or you're in, it's your responsibility. Don't let yourself go to an edge of no control, of no return, because we talk about resiliency. Sometimes, you know, resiliency, bound, you know, ability to fall and bounce back. There really is such a thing as resiliency capacity, which means you fall and you are unable to bounce back. And that's a threshold we don't want anybody to get to. So regardless, I'm saying this over and over because it's so important. Let it sink in, regardless of your community. You don't have to go and then say, I went, if you know they're not supportive. If you know your community is not supportive of the challenges that you're going through, go seek help. Even if you don't have to share, call me. I'll talk, I'll talk with you about it. If you really must talk to somebody and your community is not, I'll, I'll sit and I'll listen. But it's your responsibility. Do not go because of somebody. Go because of you, because you matter and your life matters most. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I like that you said, you know, you don't necessarily have to share because you don't. It's not really anybody's anybody's business. Um, but if you do decide to share, you know, there's there's benefits to that as well. You'll be surprised how often people will say like, oh, me too. I've been dealing with this. And that's part of the thing, right? Like so many of us are suffering in silence, unquote, because we don't want to talk about it. We don't want us to be seen as less than, but then you start talking about it and you realize that other people are dealing with depression or anxiety. Um, I know for me, something that's been really difficult for me to talk about lately is that I've been having these really bad anxiety attacks when leaving, not trying to leave the house. Like I've kind of developed agoraphobia a little bit because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that's so embarrassing. Like I'm that person who used to be all over the place yeah. and I'm having a panic attack walking out my door. But I finally talked about it and I'm surprised how many people are like, oh, me too, me too. Yeah. And I, I thought I was the only one just said, you know, dealing with this from the pandemic, but there's really a lot of other people dealing with it. And I think, especially as we talk about minority black community with that stigma that's there, the only way to really get rid of it is to have these conversations to talk to people about it. So they realize that they're not alone and then hopefully they feel confident to speak up about it as well. Absolutely. And we owe it to ourselves and our fellow human beings to create safe environments. As much as I say, my mental wellness is my responsibility. Creating a safe space for others is equally my responsibility. So even if you don't understand what your fellow neighbor or friend is going through, you at least owe it to them not to be judgmental, not to be hateful, but rather, even if you can just listen and empathize, mm -hmm. you don't and I think to it's understand also, it. Yeah. And I think it's also so important that we share, not just for the community, but for our families specifically. Mm -hmm. There are so many, and, you know, especially in the black community, you know, you don't want to share problems. You don't want to talk about certain things, but it can help your family members down the line knowing that this thing is within the family because a lot of times, especially when we go from mental health to mental illness, it's genetics, it's in your yeah. DNA. But if nobody's talking about it, now this person is dealing with this thing, feeling like they're all alone, not knowing their uncle, their aunt, their whoever has had it down the line and dealt with it as well. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, when I say, even if you don't have to share, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm not going because when I said this, this is how it was treated. This is how it was treated. If you feel sharing is going to negatively impact your care and your wellness, it's okay not to share with this group of people, even if they are family. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes as well, 
you may not be able to get through to your circle, but somebody else might. Mm -hmm. So it's also important to look within your circle and say, who's that person that this person I'm trying to break through to would listen to? And sometimes you may not be the ones sharing how you're feeling or what you're going through directly. You may have to go through a third party. And sometimes that third party is that provider that you're seeing. You know, invite your family members, invite your friends, whoever you feel like sharing. If you feel you cannot articulate it in such a way that they would understand, take them to one of your sessions. You know, if they care about you, they would at least go ahead and listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I like that you mentioned as well that there are some free resources because, you know, one of the roadblocks to minorities getting that mental health um, help, A, is the stigma as we mentioned, but also B, just the resources, whether they have insurance to cover it, finding providers, more specifically providers that are, are like them as well, because yeah. sometimes it's harder to talk to somebody who you feel like doesn't relate on any level. Um, it's part of why here in Delaware, I love that we have the Black Brown Therapist Directory or Delaware Therapist Directory, um, because having that, that, I guess, cultural competence um, yeah. is it makes a huge difference when you're talking to somebody. Absolutely. And when you are booking a, a mental health session, whether it's behavioral health, whether it's psychiatry, whether it's with a psychologist, just in the realm of mental wellness, always ask for somebody that you feel you would be comfortable with. A lot of organizations and medical practices would actually ask you, do you prefer a man or a woman? Is race of importance to you? You know, is gender of importance to you? So some of those practices would actually ask you. Not all practices are big enough to have a diverse pool of providers, but some do. And if it's of importance to you and that practice doesn't have it, then it's okay to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing like sitting across from a session with your um, mental health provider and you don't even believe that they understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. So it's hard to really um, be receptive of that session. Yeah, yeah so, and I always tell people like there is nothing wrong with shopping around at first, like, cause you're not gonna know until you sit across from that person and talk to them. And if you're not feeling, you know, a connection, um, it's okay if you want to change. I usually give it at least like one or two sessions cause the yeah. first one you're nervous anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think it's not clicking and it's not working, it's doing yourself a disservice to stay with somebody who you don't feel comfortable opening up with because that defeats the purpose of going to therapy. Um, so I always say, you know, feel free. Because sometimes what you think you want is different than what you want. Yeah. Um, you think you want this certain type of therapist and you get in the room with them and you're like, oh no, this is not going to yeah. work. And that's okay well, too. I'm laughing because that happened to me. So mm -hmm. I always, I want a young black woman just like myself. I want us to have a conversation just like we're having now. Yeah. That's what therapy is for me. Let's talk. And that's what I've always looked for. But I've always been in places where I really, it, it's been hard to find a Black young woman therapist. Mm -hmm. So I had this therapist that she was a young Black woman. She was not. And I walked in the first session and I was very judgmental. And uh, first words out of her mouth, second words, and the whole time she's speaking, I'm saying, I'm not coming back. Mm. Well, I never went back. Mm. It didn't work out. Yeah. The whole session, not because she wasn't young, black, and she just wasn't relatable. Yeah, I would say certain things and she was looking at me like, what? You mm. know, like, like I was coming from space or something. She yeah. wasn't relatable. Um, but I met another therapist. That wasn't young, black, and, and, and looked like me. And I walked in because they asked me when I was booking, does it matter? And a man or a woman, I said, no. Does race, I said, no. And I just said, God, whichever person I walk into that room, I hope it's a match. And if it's not, hey, you know, we'll find somebody. And, um, here it comes. Can you go up? Let me finish, please. Yeah, those are the kids. It's okay. I'll be right there. Yeah. And um, 
Yeah, first session, she really, I tell you, this woman took the time and even just, we, we talked, we even went over. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I didn't come here looking for you, but hey, we right. tried, you know. And so she's still my therapist today and she's not young, black and looks and doesn't look like me. And she's still my therapist today. So I agree with you that sometimes what you think you want, it's not really what you need. Mm -hmm. so we also if you're a person of faith just also just walk with the spirit of discernment and just involve you know God into the process that's why we really hold on spirituality as well I'm a Christian whatever your spiritual beliefs are um, just always honing on faith Mm -hmm. to help you because this is such a delicate aspect of your life so I don't know why you would want to do it without faith or without incorporating, you know, your spiritual beliefs in it. So just always honing on that as well as you search for a therapist, because it's, it's as important of a relationship, like finding a life partner. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's actually interesting because that's definitely an area where I, I've tried to focus in on, mm-hmm. um, is the faith community because in minority communities, especially the black community, faith is a huge, huge part for us. And sometimes it's almost uh, an obstacle or a barrier to getting mental health. Pray about because it. People <laughs> think, yeah, they can pray it away or they can go see a pastor who isn't trained on it. And while praying works and um, your pastor might be able to listen to you, therapists are equipped with the tools they need, you know, to, to help you. Um, and so there's, there's room for both. Um, you don't have to give up one to find the other. And it's unfortunate because sometimes people think like, Oh, if I go to a therapist and I'm saying my faith isn't strong enough, but I always say, you know, he gives you the ingredients sometimes to make the cake. He doesn't just give you the cake. And sometimes the ingredients are you going to the therapist and doing and doing that work, but it doesn't take away from your faith. They, they all have different levels of expertise and all of these levels just contribute to grooming the person that you are. My pastor yes. has a therapist. My therapist has a pastor. So who am I not to have both? Right. So I promise you, and right now, um, mental wellness is such a big thing in church. A lot of churches are bringing in mental wellness because they've realized that they have to coexist. There's no other way. You see a lot of pastors killing their wives, committing suicide. It's a lot of crazy going on in church right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's, you know, is it that those people are not of faith? Did they pretend every time they got on the pulpit and preach? I don't know, but I want to believe that they never seek the help that they needed, whether it was praying through it or seeking, you know, other professional help. I don't know, but I really think that I'm applauding a lot of churches that are incorporating mental wellness practices into um, the church. Because yeah. I think it's needed. I agree. Right now, sort of my, my mission in NAMI at the moment is to try to get as many of the faith-based leaders to get mental health first aid certified. Because I think that is such a great first step. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. But oh, um, I can't tell you enough um, how much I appreciate your time. You well, know, as you mentioned earlier, you're, you're so busy. But it's such an important topic and such a, a needed topic. So I'm glad we were able to discuss it because the more we have these conversations and I think for people to see people all across the board, different professions, different races, different ages, but still talking about their mental health, you know, addressing their mental health, I think it helps them to realize that it's okay for them to, to do the same thing. And to also know that we all struggle too. We, we just struggle. get past it different I'll ways. You. you shared about not wanting to leave the house. Just a few weeks ago, I was in a very severe car accident. I haven't even shared this publicly. Just people in my really, really close community know my car. I drive a big car and it got totaled everything. Mm-hmm. And um, I see have bruises all over and here. Well, I'm and glad you're okay that you. I got yeah. out. And let me yeah. tell you, in that moment, in that car, I thought this was it. This is how God is taking me out of this world. Mm-hmm. Because my car hit when I regained consciousness, the car auto locked and I couldn't get out. I'm stuck at a pole. It's smoking and everything. Mm. 
And I said, God, if this is how you're going to take me, I need this 10 minutes because I have to call my husband and talk to my husband and kids. Mm -hmm. So I looked for a phone and I found a phone. Um, I, I jumped across from driver's seat to passenger seat and I grabbed the phone and I called. And you would think I would call 911, but I really thought I was dying that day. And I would like to spend my last minutes talking to the people. I told you my most important ministry. That's mm -hmm. how I would like to spend my last um, uh, minutes here on earth. And um, my husband didn't pick up the phone. We had just gotten out of the phone. And he said, let me get the kids ready for um, camp. And so I said, let me try this doors again. And I knew I was dying but I wasn't scared. Mm -hmm. I said, this is how I go, but I have one ask. Let me talk to my family. Mm -hmm. And I tried the front passenger door again and it opened. And I shared this story with a friend and she said, if you were frantic and panicking, you probably would not have thought about, let me try the door again. Yeah. It took the fire department three and a half hours to cut that car out of the pole, three and mm -hmm. a half hours. And the only door they could open was a door already opened from the trunk to all the other doors locked. Wow. All four airbags deployed. And um, this just happened. It's very recent, just a few weeks ago. And the first day that I drove to, it was to the doctor's office, just a five minute drive. And I got home shaking shaking and I'm somebody I'm always on the go I'm either catching a flight or driving somewhere I got home shaking the anxiety that I had to drive five minutes to see the doctor and back yeah because it dawned on me that when I finally got discharged from the hospital and I walked home that was the first time I cried outside that accident adrenaline rush everything I didn't even feel pain until probably four hours later then I realized, oh my God, because I was bleeding, but I was not in pain. Adrenaline rush. That adrenaline will do it. Hours later, I could not believe the pain I was in. I was like, I feel like I was in a car accident. Yes, I was. That's when I started feeling it. But no tears. When I finally got discharged from the hospital and I walked into my home, I saw my kids. I walked into my home. I realized I probably would have left that day and never returned. Mm -hmm. that's when I cried for the first time. And I'm saying this to say, sometimes we internalize a lot of things and we don't really fully process things that we go through. Mm -hmm. And that contributes, we need to release. Part of really protecting our mental wellness is releasing. We need to release. I cried so hard and then I prayed. I was thankful. I just ruined my car, but I got out of life. Yes. Yeah. And I'm able to, it's not a chance. I'm able to come home and hug my kids and just, I'm able to be here this moment, this moment I am here, I'm alive. And the anxiety from driving, I know it'll be time, I'll get over it, I hope. But that's normal. When you go through something, whether it's being home for three years because of COVID, if you're feeling anxious to leave the house, that's normal. You know, just start practicing. Maybe don't go out and be out for three hours. Maybe it's a five minute drive down the store. Yeah. Maybe something you would normally walk, you know, just start practicing. Because for me, I'm not giving up driving. <laughs> Who am I? I don't have a chauffeur to take me around. Right. I don't get around. Right. So I have to practice. Whether it's, you know, short drives here and there and until I can say, you know what, I'm ready for a road trip again. Mm -hmm. But the anxiety is real. And um, we have to first acknowledge, embrace it, and then navigate through it. Because mm -hmm. it's not going to be here forever. But we cannot treat it by avoiding it. We can't treat it by not dealing with those emotions. It's so important that we deal with those emotions and release. Yep, absolutely. I could not agree more. And, you know, I'm trying to work through mine because I'm not one to just 
settle in the negative it's almost like okay challenge accepted like we yeah. are going to get past this like I'm not letting this one thing hinder all of my life plan and so um that's you know talking about therapists and prayer and putting all those things together to figure out a way that works and also like you said just acknowledging where you are and sometimes you do need to take baby steps which I know for some of us like I'm one of those like oh I make a goal I work on it I achieve uh-huh. it sometimes it's harder for me yeah. to be like okay I have to take a baby step to get here but sometimes that's what you do until what is it like if you can't walk crawl if you can't crawl like you know it's sometimes it's like that um so but whatever we're doing whatever you're doing if you're watching this help with your with your mental health um you know just know that you're not alone that there are others who are striving who are vocal and not vocal who are working on on theirs and everybody has mental health that they need to to take care of. Um, Like Dr. Ray was saying, your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, and your financial health, like it all comes together. So, um, you know, thank you again so much for for joining us. Uh, Where can people find you if they need to connect with you? Well, um, lindaarray.com, really, it's where a lot of my things are. And um, I'm also on Instagram and I'm on social media platforms as Linda Array. So L-I-N-D-A underscore A-R-R-E-Y. And for my candle lovers out there, we really have released one of the best and most non-toxic candles you can have. So um, if you're a candle lover and wish to incorporate light and candles as part of your mental wellness, um, you can go to myzenmode.com and just check out what we are offering. It's my and then zen, Z-N, mode, M-O-D-E.com. And you can also find my Zen Mode on social media as my Zen Mode. So just add my Zen Mode. We'll get you to our social media um, pages and just one last thing, be kind, because um, as you said, some people are dealing with this in silence. You just never know what um, people are going through. That's something that I've been very conscious in my own life to just make sure I'm really spitting out kindness. I'm treating people with love, respect, and kindness. Those are three things I'm actually telling my girls you know, kids, they would want to fight over a tall. And I said, are we treating each other with love, respect, and kindness right now? Because we owe that to the world because we just never know. That smile may just be a mask for me to get through this day. And you don't know. Yeah. Let's all just be kind. If that's one thing you want to do to help somebody's mental wellness, as soon as starting today, just be kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely love that because you never know. And I was treated like that. Like you never know when everyone is one straw away from breaking because like, you you know, we both said like sometimes we struggle and you put a smile on through the day, but you don't know what that person's going through. So kindness above all else. Um, Well, thank you again so much for joining me. Thank you all of you who are watching um, at home. If you haven't checked out, we have other uh, mental health conversations videos saved. Um, There's also a whole series now as well called You Are Not Alone, um, where I speak with different people who have different mental illnesses and how they've worked through that. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't um, and leave any comments below. And if you need to find me, I'm engaged at namide.org. Uh, thank you and you have a great day. Thank you.